Hello and welcome back to BioClass Bytes. In this video, we are going to talk about how genes work. Don't forget to subscribe to my channel and like and share this video. In the previous videos in this playlist, we have reviewed your grade 8 lessons on asexual and sexual reproduction, but particularly plant and animal reproduction. In this video, we are going to focus on how genes work and how genetic engineering is used to produce novel products. Every cell in your body contains hereditary instructions, okay? They specify that you will have arms rather than fins, hair rather than feathers, and two eyes rather than one. Everything about you, the color of your eyes, the texture of your fingernails, all, of, all your traits that you receive from your parents are recorded in cells in your body. So all the cells in your body contain that hereditary instruction. Now that hereditary instruction comes in the form of DNA, okay? So the essence of heredity, okay, the idea of heredity is that the cells have the ability to use that information, the DNA found in the nucleus, to produce particular proteins, okay? And those proteins will eventually affect what the cells will be like. So the information comes from the DNA found in the nucleus that is copied and interpreted by the cell to produce the appropriate proteins, and that proteins will eventually dictate the type of cells that they are. So in essence, okay, in that sense, proteins are the final uh, tools of heredity because um, the information is from the DNA and then the, the final output um, in that process would be the proteins uh, that, that's, that's used and utilized by the body in several, uh, in different ways, okay? So proteins are the tools of heredity. Now, generally, our body is made up of proteins from the melanin on your skin to the keratin on your hair and nails. And even, even some, some proteins are found in your muscles. So some proteins are also important in metabolic processes. So we are technically one giant protein. We are all running on protein. And so uh, the basis for the creation of those proteins are hereditary materials in the form of DNA. Now, to learn more about DNA, and DNA actually stands for deoxyribonucleic acid, I recommend that you watch this video from Stated Clearly, entitled, What is DNA and How Does It Work? I'll provide the link in the description below. Now, that idea um, of DNA eventually becoming protein is the topic of your lesson from grade 8, entitled, The Central Dogma of Molecular Biology. Um, you can find it in the online library. I'll provide the link in the description below. And then uh, to refresh your memory on how it happens, how the processes from DNA replication, transcription, translation, and protein synthesis occurs, I recommend that you watch this video from your genome entitled From DNA to Protein in 3D. Again, I'll provide the link in the description below. This is how gene expression occurs. So the sequence of nucleotides in DNA, okay, so that's found in the nucleus, encodes the sequence of amino acids in proteins. So this is the general idea, okay, from DNA to protein. So how does that happen? So we know that, the, that DNA is found within the nucleus. It cannot leave the nucleus. So therefore, RNA polymerase transcribes RNA from the DNA. So it, it copies segments of the, of the DNA. So then, um, it's, it's processed, the introns are um, removed, and then the remaining exons are, are spliced together or combined together to produce mRNA. Okay? M here um, corresponds to messenger, so messenger RNA. Now, the messenger, messenger RNA now leaves the nucleus and they bind to the ribosomes. Okay? So the ribosomal unit found in the cytoplasm. So, so what happens next is that um, tRNA, so transfer RNA molecules, become attached to specific amino acids um, with the help of the activating enzymes. So the amino acids are brought to the ribosomes, okay, in the order, okay, in the order, in the sequence directed by the mRNA. So the amino acids are carried and then they're attached and brought to the ribosomes. Uh, in the order by in the order directed by the um, mRNA, so it will so they will be read by threes. The code um, will be read by threes, and we call that uh, codons. Okay, the mRNA transcribed from the DNA is read by ribosomes in the increments or in in the amount of three nucleotides. So by threes, they are read by threes. We call that codons. 
So, tRNA bring, uh, tRNAs bring their amino acid to the A site in the ribosome. And then eventually, it will keep on elongating and elongating. Okay? Um, the amino, amino acids um, elongate um, as, it's, uh, as the codes are being read. Okay? Then eventually, the polypeptide grows until the protein is completed. So, you have... You have here the codes, the starting codons to jet, to um, to start the amino acid, the pro the, the creation of the proteins, and then you also have stop codons to terminate the elongation of this amino acid. So eventually, uh, you will now have a completed polypeptide chain, up a completed uh, chain of amino acid, which which can now perform its function within the cell. Now these are those. Um, uh, codons. I hope you still remember this, the genetic code. So, um, you this this is where you get the first letter, second letter here, and the third letter here. So, I mentioned that you have a start codon, okay? So, that's AUG, okay? Start codon. Um, if it is found at the beginning, so it's the start codon, but it, if it is found you know, halfway through the, through the sequence, then it's methionine. And then you also have stop codon, UAA, UAG, and UGA. So the, this tells us to stop the elongation of the amino acids. While the rest are the different amino acids. So you have phenylalanine, and then this is the codes, the codes for that. Lyosine, isoleucine, threonine, aspergine. So all these are some of the um, amino acids that are generated by our cells. So these are very important in creation of the proteins that the body will eventually use. Now, um, so a gene is a locus or region of DNA which is made up of nucleotides and this is hereditary. So this is the molecular unit of heredity. So a gene corresponds to uh, the basic inheritance of phenotypic traits. Okay? So the gene, the transmission of genes to an organism's offspring, okay, so as it is inherited, is the basis of inheritance. So a gene is the basic physical and functional unit of heredity. And eventually, that segment of a gene, okay, that this segment of the gene, um, that uh, eventually codes for a protein. So genes are made up of DNA, as you can see here. Some genes act as instructions to make specific molecules called proteins. Okay, so however, many genes do not code for proteins. So this um, helps us imagine where genes come from. So chromosomes are found within your nucleus. Okay, so these are condensed um, DNA, okay? They're very visible during cell division. But if you actually unwind it, okay? These are coiled, condensed. But if you unwind it, you will actually see that it's actually made up of DNA um, circling with their proteins, okay? With histones. And if you actually look at it closely, so this is your uh, DNA. And a segment of DNA that, that's inherited is actually a gene. So this is one gene. That gene could be the gene for the color of your eyes, which is hereditary, the genes for your hair, which can be inherited, for your height, okay, for how your liver functions, for the, your skin color. So a segment of a locus okay, of your DNA strand, okay, which is made up of nucleotides and can be passed on. So we call this a gene. Now, to learn more about what a gene is, um, I recommend that you watch this video from Stated Clearly. Um, I'll provide the link in the description below. Now, most biological traits are under the influence of polygenes. Poly means many, okay? Many genes, uh, as well as gene-environment uh, interactions, okay? So, it means that you may have the gene, but its manifestation is directed by the environment. Some genetic traits are instantly visible, okay, such as the color of your eyes and number of your limbs, um, uh, but some are not, okay? So some, some genes, so the manifestations of the genes are not visible, such as your blood type, so you need to get a test for that. Risk for specific diseases if you're a carrier of a specific disease, uh, or the thousands of basic biochemical processes that comprise life, okay? So, mot metabolic processes, so how efficient you are in terms of processing uh, metabolic waste, how fast are your metabolic um, activities within your body, um, your hormones and uh, muscle formation and all that. So, these are also important and these are actually uh, dictated by your genes. So, again, now, we are chromosomes 
are condensed DNA. They're visible during cell division. If you uncoil it, it's actually made up of uh, your uh, double helix DNA. And then a segment of that very long DNA that codes for a gene, that codes, uh, that codes for a protein, that codes for a trait that, that's made from proteins, is actually called a gene. So a segment of your DNA that codes for a protein or it codes for a function and codes for a trait that can be passed on uh, from parent to offspring, we call that a uh, gene. Okay? Now, in terms of genetics, okay, just an overview on how uh, all these principles in genetics are applied. I recommend that you watch this video entitled How Genetics Work. I'll provide the link in the description below. Now, the genetic code is the same in almost all organisms. So, the code on AGA specifies the amino acid arginine in bacteria, in humans, and in all organisms whose genetic code we have already established. So, it means that for most of the living organisms, this genetic code is the same. So, CUU, which codes for lysine, um, is the same for bacteria, for plants, for animals, for, uh, for other living organisms. Okay? It's the same for fish, for birds, for mammals, for reptiles. So all of this that we have studied so far, all of this genetic code is the same for almost all living things. That's amazing okay? because the universality of the genetic code, Okay? The similarities of all the genetic code for all living organisms is, the, is among the strongest evidence that all living things share a common evolutionary heritage. The, reason, the fact that we have the same, genet, the same genetic components, the same genetic code, only suggests that we all derive from a single common ancestor. Okay? So, so this is um, a big idea, a big, a big thing to, to think about. Okay? Because of those similarities, it's, all, it's possible for us to actually uh, copy, uh, edit, revise, uh, and, and um, tinker with the genetic materials of living things. Okay? So, for example, um, uh, we have, si since we have established that the genetic code is a strong evidence for evolution, uh, the expression of the genes uh, can actually be manifested from one um, species to another. Okay? So because we share diverse genetic code, it's possible to transfer a specific gene that codes for a specific trait from one species to another okay? by introducing that gene to another. So what happened here in this example? So a, toba a tobacco plant expressing a firefly gene. So the, a, toba a toba tobacco plant um, has this yellow glow produced by the chemical reaction catalyzed by the protein uh, product of the firefly gene. So they have the fire, fire um, they were able to use the firefly gene and have it manifested by a tobacco plant. So imagine the gene came from a firefly, but it's being manifested by a tobacco plant. Okay? We have here a pig expressing a jellyfish gene. So researchers injected a jellyfish gene from a, for a fluorescent protein. Okay? Jellyfish gene came from a jellyfish and introduced that to a fertilized pig eggs. Eventually, when the, the pig, uh, pig eggs were um, um, hatched, uh, or, or when the pig eggs were um, uh, eventually, when they grew into an embryo and eventually fetus, and then when they were given birth to, okay, they develop into a fluorescent pig like this, showing uh, the, in their snouts and, and in their uh, toenails uh, that uh, jellyfish gene, okay, fluorescent protein. Okay? So um, here we have a transgenic pig, okay, almost, uh, almost the same. So the piglet on the right is actually a conventional piglet. The, the piglet from the left actually, ito yun, no? actually, uh, express that gene from a jellyfish that encodes that green fluorescent protein. Okay, so the color in the pignet, piglet's nose, okay, is due to the expression of that introduced gene. So this came from a jellyfish. The gene for that came from a jellyfish. It was only made possible because living things share this code, genetic code. 
and we just have to transpose it from one species to another if you want to express the gene in that organism okay this trans transgenic animals so across genes okay transgenic animals indicate the universal nature of the genetic code it means that it is possible to get the, the genes from one organism from one species to another Okay, because the code is universal, genes transcribed from one organism can be translated in another. Okay, the mRNA is fully able to dictate a full, a functionally active protein. Okay, so it can be transferred, okay, from one organism to another and can be successfully transcribed and translated in their new host. So even if the gene came from a jellyfish, it was successfully transcribed uh, and translated by the pig's body. Okay? This universality of gene expression is the central to many advances of this field of genetic engineering. Now, um, so how, do how does genetic engineering use, is used to produce novel or new products? So to give you a big idea on how it happens, I recommend that you watch this video from Scientific American entitled, What is a Genetically Modified Food? I'll provide the link in the description below. This one also, how are GMOs created, genetically modified organisms? Um, uh, again, I'll provide the link in the description below. Okay, so because basically food, genetically modified food is the, is the first uh, up general application of genetic engineering. Now, you can also look at the products of genetic engineering. So based from the research of the previous students, um, you can find it in the online library. I'll provide the link in the description below. Now, how does gene genetic engineering work? So, one way to visualize it is through recombinant DNA. So, that's combination of DNA from two sources. So, many restriction endonucleases produce DNA fragments with sticky ends. So, basically, the idea there is to cut segments of the DNA, okay, cut the segments of the DNA to create sticky ends, or these are the parts that can be merged with another source. So, for example, this one came from one organism, so if you just cut it at this specific point, then these are available, sticky ends are available for um, um, merging okay, or, or meeting up with the sticky end of, a different, of the different species. So you see here dark blue, so these are the DNA of one species. Then you have light blue, this one is the DNA of another species. So the sticky ends here created by the restriction endonucleases makes it possible to, to meet, to submerge, to ligate, or to join the strand of two different species. So the product there is a recombinant DNA molecule. You can visualize it like Legos, okay, where in this part is available to be to be merged or to be stuck with another Lego piece. Okay. This time the Lego piece is will come from a different species. In our in the previous example, for example for a from a pig um, a DNA with um, a jellyfish DNA or from a tobacco DNA with a firefly, firefly DNA. So that's, it's made possible and the result is a recombinant DNA molecule. So what's the application of recombinant DNA? So we can actually create, or we, and we have created genetically engineered plants, okay? So here, creating transgenic plants using agrobacterium transformation so what happens here um, is that the the um, bacteria uh, with the scientific name agrobacterium tomefaciens uh, so what happens here is that uh, the plasmid okay uh, is removed and cut open so the plasmid is the genetic material okay of that um, um, species okay of agrobacterium then um, so it's cut, it's removed and cut, and then the gene of interest, whatever that may be, the one that you want to introduce to a plant, okay, is eventually inserted into that bacterium, and then it is returned, it's isolated, and then inserted back into the, um, into the bacteria. So the, the plasmid, their genetic material, is returned, it's put back into agrobacterium, and then they use that agrobacterium to in fact, uh, plant cells, okay, in uh, the plants that, that they are growing in a medium. So they use that 
uh, bacterium to actually infect plant cells. And when they do so, they transfer the new gene into the chromosome of the plant cell. So the bacterium um, infects the plant cell and transfer the, the new material into the plant cell. Then that plant cell will eventually divide in that medium, grow and reproduce. And then eventually uh, the daughter cells, uh, the, the daughter cells which receive, the, the plant daughter cells which receive that gene of interest coming from agrobacterium will eventually grow and reproduce and manifest the protein okay in that new plant so these cultured cells can be used to grow a new plant with the introduced gene so this is the general idea on how they were able to create genetically engineered plants using agrobacterium tumefaciens get the genetic material of the bacterium insert the gene of interest put it back allow it to infect the plant cell, then the plant cell will now have the gene of interest. The plant cells will grow and reproduce and eventually become a new plant showing now the new, the introduced gene. Okay, so what are the products? So this is the idea and what are the products for that? So they were able to create transgenic rice. Okay, transgenic rice that offers different um, imp improvements in its, in its diet. So for example, um, coming from um, beans, the ferritin gene is transferred into rice, okay, uh, uh, from beans, okay. So, the ferritin protein increases iron content of the rice. So, this is one example of a genetically engineered plant, a transgenic rice. A gene coming from a different plant is introduced, increasing the iron content of that rice when eaten. Then, phytase gene from uh, a fungus, a spergillus fungus, is transferred into the rice. Okay, so eventually the rice will have this um, um, gene, which, uh, so phytate, which inhibits iron reabsorption, is destroyed by the phytase gene. So, um, um, so it, does, it now allows um, iron reabsorption. Another wild rice, um, Methylothionine gene is transferred from rice, uh, 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 common rice from wild rice. So that protein supplies extra sulfur to increase iron uptake of that um, of whoever eats that rice. And then from daffodil, enzymes for beta carotene synthesis are transferred from daffodil into rice. And that beta carotene, um, uh, a precursor to vitamin A, is synthesized within the rice chromosome so this one is now being carried by the transgenic rice and then whatever advantageous pro advantageous um, molecules are found here or protein are found here can be ingested and can be uh, taken advantage of whoever he, uh, eats the rice so in this case um, by the swiss bioengineer ingo potricus the, the products of his transgenic rice allow vitamin iron a and vitamin a to be lessened uh, deficiencies to be lessened in whoever consumes the rice, particularly in developing countries. Now, um, the genetic engineering did not stop in plants. They were also able to apply the concept in um, animals. So we see here an example of uh, the production of bovine, bovine somatotropin okay, through genetic engineering. Okay? So what happens here is instead of using agrobacterium to mefacients, what they used uh, was uh, E. coli, Escherichia coli. So the same idea, the plasmid, the genetic material is removed and cut open using restriction endonuclease for sticky ends. Then the cow somatotropin gene is isolated from the cow cell. Then that gene of interest, the somatotropin gene, is inserted into the bacterial uh, plasmid. Okay? And then that is returned into E. coli. And then that E. coli is grown in fermentation tanks. So they are now carrying that somatotropin gene. Then somatotropin is removed from um, the bacteria after, and then eventually purified. And then that bovine somatotropin is administered. This one is administered, injected, introduced into the cow. And the goal here is to enhance milk production so that this cow will eventually produce uh, more milk. So this is what they did to genetically engineer cow in order for them to produce more milk. 
Now, other examples of gene uh, manipulation. So, we see here Herman, the Wonder Bull. He is actually uh, created by GenFarm, a California biotechnology company. He is a bull that possesses gene for human lactoferrin. Human lactoferrin. Um, uh, these are an uh, confers antibacterial and iron transport properties to human. So, um, so we can now, uh, they, we, it has, a uh, Herman has this gene coming from a human in creation, in terms of creating, uh, producing milk. Many of Herman's female offspring now produce milk containing HLF and they intend to build a herd of transgenic cow that can actually produce uh, this human lactoferrin, okay? So that's a protein and found in human uh, milk, okay? So, um, so that's one application. Um, then they also were able to create wilt flu proof flowers, so this will never wilt anymore. So ethylene, the plant hormone that causes fruits, fruit to ripen, also causes flowers to uh, wilt. So researchers are at Purdue have found the gene and replace it with a gene. So they remove the gene that, that corresponds to ethylene and replace it with an insensitive gene to ethylene. So it allows uh, flowers such as carnations to last longer even after thir three weeks after cutting, okay? So instead of just dying or wilting after three days. So they could um, st um, stay fresh longer for almost 21 days by just by removing that um, gene that responds to ethylene. So cows that produce human milk, then uh, wilt through a uh, wilt proof flowers are examples. Then we also have your super, sa super salmon. Okay, Canadian fisheries scientists have inserted recombinant growth hormone okay, in salmon, okay, in developing salmon embryos, creating the first transgenic salmon. Okay, so they have shortened production cycles. Okay, they are 11 times heavier than regular uh, salmon, and this they are they are generally bigger. So this is very profitable in the fish industry. Then we also have weevil proof peas. Okay. So, weevils are actually pests, okay? Um, so, a team of U.S. and Australian scientists have engineered a gene that's only expressed in the seed of the pea plant. The enzyme inhibitor encoded by this gene inhibits the feeding of weevils, okay? So, they, they make it, so the weevils do not have an appetite anymore for the bean. So, they do not eat it anymore. So, this allowed a significant increase up to 40% uh, so, so, because of this, this uh, no longer happens, okay? 40% of stored grains are lost to pests. So, because of this, we are no longer losing this amount of food to weevils. Now, another application of genetic engineering is in the form of cloning. I hope you're familiar with cloning. So, here, uh, this one is an example of a cloning experiment, okay? We're in... Um, they get, uh, so we have here two different uh, species of uh, sheep, okay? So they got, uh, from the white-faced sheep, they got a mammary cell, so that's from the mammary gland. It's e extracted and grown in a nutrient-deficient solution that, that arrests the cell cycle, so it does not continue the cell cycle. And then, um, so from the black-faced sheep, an egg cell is extracted from its ovaries, uh, so, the nucleus is removed from the egg cell, okay, from the black face sheep using a micropipette. Now, they got, uh, so, so there, then they, uh, they got the nu nucleus, okay, a mammary cell is inserted inside the egg cell. So, they removed the nucleus and then they got the nucleus coming from this um, donor, okay, introduce that here, okay. And then, electric shock uh, actually triggers the cell uh, and, allo and allows them to undergo cell division. So, it, it creates this idea that the cell has, the egg cell has already been fertilized. Okay? So, again, no? so the nucleus will come from a different sheep, white-faced sheep. Then, from a black-faced sheep, only the cytoplasm and the cell membrane of the egg cell was donated. The nucleus will come from there. Then, using electricity... Um, electric shock, it triggers the cell division. 
Then eventually that uh, cell division will continue until it becomes an embryo. Then after that embryo, it's implanted into the surrogate mother. Okay, into the surrogate mother, into a, to that black face ship. Okay, after a five-month pregnancy, a lamb that is genetically, ident genetically identical from the mammary donor, mammary cell donor was born. And this was that. So even if the, the lamb was, was given birth by its surrogate, the genetic material, the nucleus actually came from a white-faced uh, sheep. So even if the, the surrogate mother has a black face a sheep, the offspring has a white face sheep because this one is a direct clone, genetic clone of this uh, donor. Okay, so this is that adult, eventually which it reached adulthood. So this is the general idea of cloning um, that has been done already. So this one, this was that actual images. Okay, so Dolly here, the, the very famous Dolly, uh, that was the first clone sheep. Um, so this was her um, surrogate mother, that black face sheep. But she was actually a clone of the one who donated the mammary cell. Okay? So we have here another example of cloning, this time in cats. So CC, which stands for carbon copy, is the first clone cat. Okay, here, right. And this is her single parent. So, Rainbow is the one who, who donated the nucleus in the cloning procedure. Um, so, following this procedure, that eventually resulted into CC. Uh, but uh, they are not identical. So, Rainbow is a classic calico cat, uh, while a CC has a gray and white fur. But uh, genetically, no, they are, uh, she is a result of cloning of this, rain, of this cat named Rainbow. So, this is CC. Then this is rainbow. Now uh, we can also use. We have also used. I okay, already done. Okay, we have also used genetic engineering in the field of um, medicine. Okay, so we see here an example of um, of um, mice, um, wherein one is altered. Okay, by applying human growth hormone. So these are genetically identical mice. But the large one has an extra gene, has one extra gene, the gene encoding human growth hormone. So even if they have the same genetic material, this one has an extra gene for human growth hormone. Okay, so the gene uh, was added to the mouse's uh, genome by genetic engineers and now it's now part of the um, mouse's body. So as you can see, it's generally bigger to its um, uh, to its clone, okay, or to its uh, genetically identical sibling, okay, so the, it's bigger because of that addition of human growth hormone. Now, this is a, this is a list of diseases being treated um, uh, through gene therapy, okay, so by correcting whatever is wrong in the genetic makeup of the patient. So, cancer is now being treated in the, by using gene therapy, by, by correcting the, the incorrect gene or the malfunctioning gene of the patient's body. So cancer such as melanoma, ovarian cancer, breast cancer, prostate cancer, lymphoma are all being treated using gene therapy. Severe combined immunodeficiency, cystic fibrosis, uh, hemophilia, Hunter syndrome, rheumatoid arthritis, even AIDS are all being uh, studied through clin clinical trials and being tested if it is possible to treat this using gene therapy. Um, so, what are examples of uh, gene therapy? So, here uh, we have uh, a gene therapy using retroviral vector. So, what happened here is, um, uh, what they did was insert the RNA version of the normal allele into a viral vector. Okay, so this one is a viral DNA, but that's not, it's not harmful actually to the body okay so what we need what we need was to actually introduce the, the normal gene that's absent from the patient's body so the absence of this gene is causing the disease so they are now putting that into the viral dna okay then let that virus infect bone marrow cells that was taken from the from the patient okay so they allow that to in to uh, they allow the virus to um infect the bone marrow cells now, from the bone marrow cells, the viral DNA 
carrying the normal allele is now inserted into that uh, bone marrow cell. And that bone marrow cell is eventually introduced again, returned to the patient again, but this time carrying the uh, normal gene coming from um, uh, artificially, um, artificially created outside the patient's body. So it's now being introduced and eventually because of that, the bone marrow through active cell division will imbibe that in, um, uh, engineered cells into the patient and then it will produce that missing uh, protein from the patient's body. So hopefully it, he will um, now, um, he or she will now improve in terms of um, health. Okay? So this is how gene therapy is being used using a retroviral vector. So the carrier of the gene is a viral DNA um, or, or the virus, okay, so virus. Now other forms, uh, goats are being used as farm animals. So this transgenic goat carries a gene for human blood protein antithrombin, which, which uh, the goat secretes in her milk. So patients with um, a rare hereditary condition, um, lacks, uh, which, which this protein is lacking, suffer from formation of blood clots in their blood vessels. Okay, so they have this disease. So from the milk of the goat, easily purified, the protein is used to prevent blood clots in those patients okay so from the protein coming from the milk okay it actually saved the patient's lives if they ever undergo surgery or childbirth so goats are being used um, to to create that um, uh, protein lacking in some people Now, another application of recombinant DNA is re creating recombinant vaccine, okay? So, this is a, a strategy for constructing a subunit of vaccine for that disease herpes simplex, okay? So, this is the herpes simplex virus. So, they, uh, the, DNA, the uh, DNA from that virus is extracted. Then, that simplex gene is isolated. Okay, is the DNA is extracted, the gene is a gene is isolated, then that gene, that gene is introduced from a harmless uh, vaccinia uh, virus or cowpox virus. So this is harm are uh, harmless in humans. So they got uh, that gene. Okay, if you still remember sticky ends, and then they introduce that gene from the herpes simplex virus, and then they return that into the harmless cowpox virus. So that small a small fragment of the herpes simplex virus is being carried by the cowpox virus. Now that cowpox virus um, is now the vaccine um, uh, that's now injected into the human body. That small amount will actually trigger the antibodies to be produced in the body. Antibi antibodies against herpes simplex. So, uh, because of that uh, small introduction, the body now has antibodies against herpes simplex. So, eventually, when, should the body encounter a uh, herpes simplex virus in the future, it is not, it now possess, uh, possesses the human immune response against herpes simplex. So, it can now fight off the infection. So, this is the general idea of how vaccine works. Introducing small amount of the dangerous um, virus to the body just so the body can produce the antibodies against it. Now, another application of recombinant DNA is creating st stem cells or utilizing stem cells. Now, just a recap, stem cells are very special cells because they can actually grow and differentiate into different type of cells. So, a stem cell can divide into another type of stem cell and a progenitor cell okay uh, which will which can differentiate into different types of cells into a fat cell or bone cell or white blood cells or muscle cells or other forms of the body so stem cells are actively dividing cells which can become any type of cell so what they do here um so what they do here is to actually culture embryonic stem cells so they came from embryos so animal stem cells, which can be isolated from the early embryos, okay, or adult tissues, um, 
that can be grown in a culture and they can self-perpetuate and um and are relatively undifferentiated so what they do is they just harvest that they just harvest that uh, embryonic uh, cells okay early embryo okay allow it to culture and grow and then by putting it into different types of cultures different types of culture conditions either acidity temperature or pressure they can grow and become different types of cells liver cells nerve cells and blood cells okay now um, from that uh, stem cell then uh, for example if the patient will eventually need liver cells in the future then um, it can uh, get it can actually get uh, liver cells from the hospital or from the institution and then the uh, uh, the patient can have his liver cells um, uh, uh, can have his liver cells uh, exchange for a, for a better functioning one so if his liver cells are failing or his actual liver tissues or liver organ um, the actual organ is failing then it can be replaced with a more uh, with a healthier uh, liver cells so this is actually quite um quite uh, popular nowadays especially for those who can afford it um, so while the mother is um, is gestating or during her pregnancy the um, they will allow um, doctors okay to harvest some embryonic stem cells uh, and then they will freeze it or keep it in the laboratory so that when their child grows and eventually will need um, organ replacements in the future they could get the stem cells from that laboratory Okay. So even the parents can also get stem cells from their offspring because they share 50% of their genetic material. So that actually lowers the chances of um, organ rejection. So it's similar to an insurance. So the, 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 if, if, that, if that baby has a, a stored stem cell somewhere, whatever happens to that baby when that grows up into an adult, it has this insurance that its cells and tissues and organs can be replaced um, in the future but of course that whole process is very very expensive um, very few could afford it okay so this is what i was uh, telling you a while ago no? so this is how embryonic stem cells can be used to replace damaged tissue so in the union of egg cell and sperm cell okay from that blast blastocyst Okay, that will eventually become an embryo. Okay, um, uh, you can actually culture embryonic stem cells. Okay, from that very early embryo, very early um, um, development of that offspring. Okay, now from here, from here, okay, then the baby is now growing and growing and growing. But from here, it's being cultured in the laboratory. That embryonic stem cell stem cell can can grow to whichever type of cell they need okay they need uh, needed by the patient okay so for example if this baby grow up and eventually will need um, um for example whatever for for example nerve cells then from from the stem cells they can grow nerve cells and eventually inject it into the patient when uh, he he or she needs it the tissues responds to local chemical signals and it can now replace that damaged cells so it will have this unlimited supply of of fresh cells that can replace the worn out cells in the patient's body because uh, the cells will, will is actually coming from its own embryonic cells uh, they will have they will have a complete match to the patient's immune system so there will be no um, rejection coming from the patient's body now this one is quite um it's quite uh, amazing to think about but even in the field of genetics it's actually possible to apply genetic engineering so we have here two cases so this one is the uh, two profile the two dna profiles okay that led to the conviction of tommy lee andrews for rape in 1987 so um so this is the uh, victim's victim rapist semen okay so this was the semen uh, the dna profile of coming from the semen that was found in the victim's body okay 
So as you can see, this is the DNA profile okay, when, when, when uh, performed in the laboratory. Now, they, they, were, uh, they got um, the DNA coming from the suspect's blood. Okay? Coming from the suspect's blood. So as you can see, there's a clear match between the um, uh, uh, DNA found in the rapist semen inside the, the victim and the suspect's blood. Okay? There's a clear match between the DNA of the rapist and the, and the suspect, allowing, um, uh, allowing the conviction of the um, uh, criminal Tommy Lee Andrews in 1987. Now I'm so so the DNA sample was very um, useful in that conviction. Now this is um, uh, from the case of O.J. Simpson, and blood samples from the murder scene of his former wife. This was highly publicized and controversial, uh, quite a controversial murder trial. So uh, we see here um, the the DNA profile coming from the foyer, uh, and these uh, so this is the blood coming from that entrance of the house okay and these are the dna profiles of the different suspects so blood coming from the foyer this is from oj simpson and these are from the different people goldman brown and the only and the only profile that match is from oj simpson okay so because of this it was enough for he, for him to be convicted so because the question was why was his dna found in the foyer in the entrance of the house where the wife was murdered right the murder scene of his former wife so, and it matches with his dna okay? now um, they were also able to use uh, forensics to genetic engineering and forensics to release in an innocent man or to clear a man from his um conviction so in 1984 earl washington was convicted convicted and sentenced to death for the rape of rape and murder of Rebecca Williams. Uh, eventually his life his com his sentence was committed to life in prison. But in 2000, STR analysis by forensic scientists um, uh, associated with innocence project showed conclusive evidence that he was in, in innocent in this crime that he was accused of. So so what they did was, um, so this was from the semen found in the victim, and these were the S, um, STR markers, okay, in the DNA sample, and this was from Earl Washington, okay, this was the DNA profile, and this is from Kenneth Tinsley, okay, so this was found in the semen, but as you can see, Earl Washington's DNA does not match with what's found on the victim. Okay, so what actually matches was not from Earl Washington, but what matches with the victim was the person, Kenneth Tinsley, 1719, 1316, 1212, 12, 12, not Earl Washington. Okay, um, so uh, another, that, was the, uh, that was the other man, Ken, um, Kenneth Tinsley, who was in prison because of an unrelated conviction. So because of this, um, he pled guilty to the murder of Rebecca Williams and Earl Washington was proven innocent. So because of genetic engineering, because of um, uh, DNA analysis, he was, um, he was saved from his uh, unlawful conviction. Now, um, we have um, discussed a lot of application of genetic engineering and here are some more applications. So I recommend that you watch the following videos. Um, dissecting the application of genetic engineering, in this case, um, GMOs, okay? So this is from SciShow. Why are GMOs considered bad by some people? I'll provide the link in the description below. Um, this one is from Kurgizast. Are GMOs good or bad? Genetic engineering in our food, again, linked in the description below. And here, CRISPR, quite a controversial um, method in genetic engineering. So this one still from Kurgizat, um, how will uh, genetic engineering will change everything forever, particularly of CRISPR? Again, linked in the description below. And how gene editing is curing diseases. So we've talked about gene therapy a while ago. Um, so if you're interested, kindly watch this video. 
And finally, now this one, a scientist, this one's quite new, uh, recent. A scientist from China claims that he was uh, he helped create the world's first genetically modified human babies. So this is no longer done in the level of sheep or cats, but genetically engineered humans. So this is quite controversial. So if you want to look at it, um, I'll provide the link in the description below. Um, so this one is for your reflective journal log. How how does CRISPR ch how CRISPR changes the human DNA forever? So very controversial topic. You will learn more in this video from Tech Insider. Um, I'll provide the link in the description below. That ends our video. I hope you learned something new. Don't forget to subscribe to my channel and like and share this video. Till next time, goodbye!